committee day. The recording is set. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We are in the last part of week four for social equity. Um, we are thrilled to have you, and we are going to get started with the meeting. I'm going to call it to order. Um, before we go over that, uh, again, we've called the meeting to order. We're going to talk about uh, public comments today. And before we do that, so we can go in order, may I get a motion from someone to approve the minutes from 927? Motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you so much. So because we are uh, uh, September 30th, I'm going to slip back one slide just as a quick reminder that we have our first milestone tomorrow to put forth a plan for reducing or eliminating fees for social equity applicants with our second coming up on the heels just behind. I feel like a sports commentator today. Sorry about that. Um, it's, so we have October 1st and October 15th um, coming our way. So I am going to jump back over to the agenda. These are the topics we'll be going over today. Um, the minutes have been approved. So now if you're okay, everybody, I'm gonna move over to a summation of the public comments. There are um, five of them or other six of them today. So if you'll bear with me, I'm not gonna read them all, but I am gonna hit some of the highlights since you all did receive them. So um, Kelly's story brought up the point that disability benefits may not provide enough funding to support the cost of uh, medical cannabis products for those who need them. She also wanted to make note to the board and others here that people that live in government housing are not allowed to cultivate cannabis. So medical marijuana is not financially obtainable to many of those who may need it and can't manage their own crops. She noted this was a problem. She has thoughts and ideas. I'm sure hopefully we'll hear more from her on that. But she also wanted to note that cannabis should not be financially unobtainable to anyone who relies on or benefits from it. Again, that's from Kelly's story. Um, Ronald Williams uh, from Mr. Seacraft Cannabis. Um, I'm not going to go through his completely because this has already been uh, addressed by the uh, subcommittee members. He did not want the requirement of the one-year residency. We have touched on that. But what is important to note in his comment is that he does want to ensure that not only is Vermont, um, the Vermont cannabis market equitable, but that it remains attractive for young diverse communities that are currently underrepresented in the state. So we thank Ronald for that. And then Joseph, um, and I'm sorry, I can't read his last name. I think it's Berger. The important thing he wanted to note is um, what went on in uh, Missouri with some applicants and that, um, folks were paying people to help consult with them to fill out applications. He noted that uh, the former president of the Missouri chapter of Minorities for Mar Medical Marijuana um, lost approximately $70,000 putting together her application, which I believe was um, possibly denied. Yes, was denied. And he said, knowing that um, folks would have to compete for a limited number of licenses, many applicants did pay top dollar to consultants for their experience in uh, legal marijuana markets for help with applications. He said the high cost and license caps created an industry in Missouri accessible only to those with money and connections instead of more black-owned marijuana businesses given the disproportionate impact of the war on drugs in communities of color. Also, Michael Shane noted the best thing the Cannabis Control Board can do to help small cultivators is to provide a provisional license and allow small cultivators a head start to grow over the winter when cooling costs are low and then sell to the integrated license holders in May. He also noted that forcing small cultivators to begin cultivation in May when costs are the highest will put them at a disadvantage. It will ensure a supply shortage and encourage only the very rich and, and parenthetically, he said, or very illegal may be able to participate. Again, that's from Michael Shane. And then um, there was an additional comment from Michael Shane that he said people should understand how competitive the market really is and raise the point that all New England states will have legal cannabis soon. He also noted um, a few different links that people can access, and I believe everyone on the subcommittee should have those, so that you can look those over. And he said a quote from one of the links is, the general consensus among plant scientists and horticulturists, as much as it pains many of us to admit it, is that the highest 
quality fruits and flowers are achieved in a controlled indoor grow environment. Again, that's from Michael Shane, and he did also add um, some resources. As a reminder to everyone in the public, if you would like to submit comments, you may do them, you may submit them at ccb.vermont.gov and the public input form where your comments will be noted, logged, and submitted to the subcommittee members. With that being said, and I know that was a mouthful, I am going to uh, move on to the start of the topics. We've approved the minutes. And Gina and Jeffrey, I'm going to turn this over to you to talk about relationships to the impacted individual and impacted family. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, so we started with impacted family. I know we did vote on this, but there was an advisory board meeting um, with all of the people from the entire board, including all of the subcommittees. And we had the bonds yesterday make a recommendation that we include domestic partner to this list. I'm not sure why the bottom of this is not showing up. Um, so it should be relationship um, to the impact of the individual, partner, legal mm -hmm. guardian, sibling, spouse, child, minor. I think it's just rearranged. Uh, minor, minor in their guardianship, grandparent and grandchild. The grandparent and grandchild is not on this list. So um, please note that that yep. is what is included in all of this. Are we okay as a committee to include domestic partner to our definition of impacted family member? Nigger? Um, I was just gonna say yes. I think that we should include domestic partner. Ashley? I agree. That was a really good addition. And Julio? I don't know what domestic partner means in this context. Vermont used to have domestic partnership before same-sex or marriage equality came to the state. Um, so you had a, a civil equivalent of marriage um, but now that we have marriage equality in the state and in all 50 states, I'm not really sure what domestic partner means. Is there a definition, especially if we have applicants who are from out of state and their, you know, state domestic laws, I mean, there are 50 different state laws about um, family law and marriage. They're not uniform, so is there so I'm so definition of what counts as domestic partner and how you would how you would establish that. So just from what I found using some links on the Vermont website, it says um, you would have a relationship agreement or a contract. So um, there would be you would need to cohabitate together uh, regarding property and finances. Um, And, um, and that you would need to create this contract and it would need to be signed. It's sort of similar to a prenuptial agreement. Um, and then there could be a power of attorney as well. Then you can make one that just looks for health care, but that would not relate to us for the subcommittee and will. So for the subcommittee terms, it would be if you had a contract or um, a, I guess power of attorney over someone. Julio, does that answer your question? Is that definition going to be disclosed in the application materials? I know the applications are. So if you have a relationship agreement or contract or a power of attorney over someone, so we can put that in parentheses if you like when we um, disclose domestic partner and then parentheses relationship agreement or contract and or power of attorney. So you can have a power of attorney over anyone, like if you have a neighbor who's elderly and they have children who are out of state who want you to have power of attorney to assist them with medical decisions for a limited period of time before the children can fly into the state. 
to participate in those decisions? Is that okay. what we're contemplating? So, so should we just have relationship agreement or contract? Gina, can I interrupt for a second? I'm just going to share yeah. with you the um, state of Vermont's HR policy on domestic partner. Um, it, it, my familiarity with domestic partner is, you know, in, in adding someone to your insurance, and I wonder if we can maybe copy some of that. Um, because typically it, it's similar to what you're saying, but um, I think would provide a little bit more to answer um, Julio's question. Can you read that out for us, please? Uh, it's a long policy. Hold on, let me see if I can go back to it. Julia, what would you like to see? Well, I'm not. I I'm not sure what we're agreeing about. Like I said, my familiarity with domestic partnership, uh, and, and this is something that our, our office was involved in, our civil rights unit was involved in, the, the uh, you know, advocating for marriage equality in Vermont. That's, so I only understood domestic partner in the context of what Vermont used to call civil unions. The statutes were amended to uh, just, just sunset the civil union law because it was no longer necessary because the, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized marriage equality. So that, that's where I'm coming from in the state policy. I don't have it in front of me, but prior to the Supreme Court's decision and the Ober Obergefell decision that recognized marriage equality, um, states that wanted to recognize civil unions would use the phrase domestic partner um, but I don't know that it, it has like an agreed upon meaning. So that's, that's all I'm saying. Um, is this, I don't know what I would be agreeing to because I, you know, some people might, some applicants might have relationships that this committee or subcommittee wouldn't consider to be the equivalent, uh, you know, or what, we, what we would regard as a family member and, and some of us might. So I, that's, that's all that you're just introducing a term that I don't think has like a settled uh, meaning and so I'm trying to figure out what that meaning would be. So um, I did drop in the chat pod a couple of links for the state of Vermont. There is a state of Vermont offers coverage to domestic partners and employees. In order to be eligible, you must certify the following criteria and it lists out six different things. It's the second link. Um, it's from the human resources page that may be um, that may assist anyone as well. Nader has his hand up, Tina, while... Yeah, uh, I just copied and pasted the six different things that define what domestic partner is. Um, so we can all read that and that's what's in the Vermont Human Resources packet um, for adding people to your health insurance. Mm -hmm. I really like the first one on here, which it says you are each other sole domestic partner and have been in an exclusive and enduring domestic relationship while sharing a residency for not less than six consecutive months prior to the submission of your application. Are we okay with using um, that definition for a domestic partner? And obviously it says neither one of you is married to anyone else. You're both 18 years of, of age. You're not blood, uh, you're not related by blood. Um, you are both in a legally binding contract and you have agreed between yourselves to be uh, responsible for each other's welfare. Leo, are you okay with using that definition? Yeah, I like the definition. Uh, I just want to clarify. Five doesn't mean that the relationship is a legally binding contract. That each person is mentally and physically capable of entering into a legally binding contract. That, which you know, this is a modern substitute for what some some laws or criteria would say that they're both of sound mind and body. 
that's really what it's about but i don't understand five to say that the part because when i think earlier you said that they have a contract and i i've never heard of a domestic couple um actually having a contract rather they just had an informal personal agreement to be together which is what i take uh factor number six to be i'm comfortable with this that it, the domestic partner as defined on the screen i'm really appreciative for uh the clarity there yeah i'm, I'm fine with that um can i, I have that added to the definition on a separate page just to give more clarity for everybody applying yes Nader? um just one small thing i wanted to see if we wanted to modify uh, for number two it says the persons are 18 years or older uh, it's my understanding you have to be 21 at least 21 to be in possession um, legally in vermont so in this context should we make it that the persons are 21 years or older or would that be irrelevant because we're just talking about domestic partners and um, I wouldn't want to create something at 21 because we're not saying that the partner needs to be 21 years of age, um, right. but I believe in order to, I'm not sure what the age limit is to get a license, which I'm assuming would be 21. Um, so if one of them was 21, that they can, um, the 21 year old would be able to get a license even right. if the partner was not 21. Right, that makes sense. Okay. With the definition of domestic partner, are you, Julio, okay with adding domestic partner to the impacted family definition? Um, yeah, I guess the related question is whether um, the whether the child of the domestic partner is included within the definition of child now because when you were just talking about spouse uh you know we don't have i guess we don't have here stepchildren um and uh you know it's sort of i guess that that brings it into further relief the um i think the state policy that was just shared a while ago i think had something about or referring to the um Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was reading. Maybe I was reading something off of the the, the actual web page where it's talking. Of, yeah, the, in the state of Vermont policy for coverage of domestic partners, there's a section on domestic partners for health coverage, and then there's a section on children of a domestic partner. And I guess that's what brought it to mind. You're muted, Gina. Sorry. Are you interested in including stepchildren into the definition, which then any marriage and domestic partner should be the same? So that would also co cover domestic partner if you want to add stepchildren to the de definition of family. Nada, um, your comments, questions? Um, I, I don't have any new comments or questions. Uh, I'm, I, I, I saw your hand raised. Oh, sorry. Would you I, I like to forward. add stepchildren to this sorry. impact of family? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Did you ask me a like question? like to add stepchildren into the impacted family? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Ashley? Yeah, I, I think that would be wise. Right. And Julio? Um, just to follow up on what's in that um, state of Vermont policy, their definition of for children of a, of a domestic partner are ones who uh, would be classified as a dependent child. So someone who lives uh, in the household and is dependent on the domestic partnership. Uh, you know, there, there are 
married couples and uh, domestic partnership couples that, you know, for which one may have children that are 30 years old and living on their own. Um, and um, so if, uh, I, I don't know that that would be, um, that might be a little bit att attenuated to, uh, to draw the line to say that you had an impacted family member if you've got an adult child who doesn't live in your household and maybe you don't really know. Um, uh, so I, I think if um, stepchildren are um, dependents, like the state policy says, I think that's a little closer. I worry, I just worry about diluting the standard for um, the candidates here so that people who would, we wouldn't typically consider to be connected to social injustices and, you know, personally as a, as a, as a licensee or an applicant. Um, so I, I raised that, that question um, as a, you know, it's something that, uh, that I, what I think is a pretty helpful guide from the state of Vermont about covered relationships. Um, I, I just wonder what the, what the other folks think about that. I haven't decided, but it's something that caught my eye is that they're not talking about uh, grown up uh, stepchildren who, who don't reside with the family. Great point, Julio. Great point. Um, I would like us to go to a vote um, based on all of the information that I have so far is that an impacted family member would be a spouse, domestic partner, a child or a stepchild that resided in the relationship when they were a minor. I hope that works for everybody. Um, a minor in a guardianship, a legal guardian, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, and grandchild. Ashley, your vote? Uh, I say yes. Thank you. To that definition. Uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm saying yes to the definition. <laughs> yes. And child and grandchild is if they were there as a minor, um, not as an adult. Um, Nada? Um, uh, my vote is yes. Thank you. And Julio? Yes. Thank you. This is going to be a very extensive comprehensive definition, but we will make sure to have it exactly stated for the Vermont Cannabis Control Board um, um, with the attachments as to what a domestic partner um, is considered as a definition for the Vermont um, Social Equity Program. Okay. Then we're going. Here's another vote. Are there any last comments or questions about application waivers and reduce licensing fees before we make a vote on this today. Okay, I'm gonna go to Nader, how do you vote on this recommendation? My vote would be yes. Ashley, how do you vote on this I'm voting on the definition of, uh, go back, what's the question again? I'm sorry, I, so the, this slides, is, um, the slides are not linking with, uh, with no, they're not. I'm sorry, that's my fault. I'm trying to get <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry, Ashley. So we're on the side of Vermont recommendations for eliminating and discontinuing fees for social equity candidates. Okay. So, yes. Yes. About this, um, we're about yes. Tina Easter ready. Um, yes. Just to I, go over it, applications will be waived. Um, and then we went with recommendation one, that the first year would be waived, the second year would be 25% of the fee, the third year would be 50% of the fee, the fourth year at 75% of the fee, and the fifth year at full price, and that there is a fee uh, waiver recommendation for your first or second year if you can show financial harm, but also show a plan on how you're going to um, remedy the situation going forward. And to clarify, 
Nader, you just voted yes for recommendation one. Right, so what, okay. based on what I was seeing on the screen, I thought I was voting on the definition uh, for the domestic partnership. Oh, sorry. But I, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. thought. That's what I thought. Matt, do you want to start off, Sorry. Yeah, so let's start this over. Nader, how do you vote on the recommendations for eliminating discounted fees for social equity in terms of application and licensing fees? Did you say eliminating discounted fees or well, uh, it's, it's on slide well, and matter. Okay, I'm, I'm voting for recommendation one. Yeah. And application fees should be waived as well, correct? Yes. Thank you. Ashley. Um, the one thing that I did like about the recommendation two was the possibility of the second year being waived uh, with qualifications being met as I just came out of the compliance and enforcement. Obviously, I don't want to see this happen, but if there's theft or if there's, um, you know, weather or just, you know, plain old, you know, operator error as far as like, learning how to grow these plants properly or you know without molds and certain things so i do like the idea of if there's a qualification met which again we can set that qualification um as well of possibly waiving the fees for the second year yeah so that is part of recommendation one i'm sorry it either is or isn't yeah okay it is okay so it's recommendation one first year wave second year 25 percent third year 50%, fourth year 75%, fifth year you pay the full price, and first and second year you're allowed to submit a waiver if you have financial hardship, but along okay. with the waiver you need to show a plan on how you're going to remedy the situation. Because yes, we do want to support them financially, but we also need to make sure that they are on track for financial independence then yes, I, I vote yes to recommendation one. Thank you, Ashley. Nader, I'm sorry, I do not know why this is going the way it is, but did you fully understand um, the recommendation that you're making right now, that it is the tiered system plus the fee, rec uh, the waiver included with it? Yes, I do fully understand. Sorry for any confusion earlier. Okay. No worries. I'm sorry for the, the tech difficulty on today. And Julio, um, what is your vote? Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's um, have that for the record. Everybody has said yes to this. Don't worry, we're going to talk about other things. We're not, we're not done yet. Um, there are some other fees that have been suggested by the market structure subcommittee which has gone into effect today and there was a provisional license application fee which i think it is now intention to apply fee they're calling it um, which would be at five hundred dollars my recommendation is because it's part of the application fee um, that would be waived as well Julio, how do you feel about that? I agree. Great. Ashley? I agree. And Nader? I agree. Okay. And as part of Vermont cannabis legislation, there needs to be an employee registration fee uh, for everyone who participates in the industry. That is at $100. Um, the recommendation was for that to be paid by businesses as it is done right now for the medicinal cannabis industry. Ashley, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think that's fine. I mean, I, I'm thinking about like pay data and what is going to all be involved for the fees for the business in and of itself just to have registered and paid employees. Like, you know, this, this cost is still a cost, but it's inconsequential to the actual um, paying people salaries and what it takes to do a pay data through Canvas. So I think I think this is fine. 
Julio? I agree. It's less than a day's wages, or it should be. So, yes, I agree. Thank you. And Nada? Uh, just to clarify, this is the $100 that pays for the identification card for the employee, or is that another $100 fee that's separate from this registration? This is an identification card that um, in order to become employed in the cannabis industry. Okay, yes, I support that. <laughs> Thank you. So please note for the record, the probational license application fee, which is now I believe called the intent to apply fee, um, is recommendation of wage employee registration fee as well. So the identification card for all of the employees is a yes from all three people. And now we have a local fee um, that will also need to be included within an application and it will be a max of a hundred dollars at this moment in time and that is what um, was submitted. Please know that all of these pricing is subject to change. Um, Nada, how do you feel about either that being waived or paid by the applicant? Uh, I think that since we've done away with the residency requirement, um, we should have a local fee. Um, and $100 isn't that much. Um, and, I, and I think it would be good to create that connection between the applicant and their community that they're planning to work in. So I, I would support it. Thank you. Ashley? Yeah, I agree. Um, beautifully said, so agreed. Thank you. And Julio? Julio, you're on mute. I, I wasn't sure if I understood whether that's an annual fee, a one-time fee, an application fee, or, or what. So. Um, from my understanding, the local fee would be an annual fee attached um, to be paid when one renews their license. But I mean, Julie, do you see it as an annual fee as well? I just want to. Yes, I think that's that. correct. I think the the licenses are on an annual basis, and that's intended to be an annual fee that goes with that. Um. So the the licensing fee is waived for your first year but you would still pay a local fee of a hundred dollars what does that reflect other than just revenue to the locality i mean what does that serve well that's any expenses that the local community will have in some other states so for example massachusetts has the two to three percent um community fee saying that there will be um, additional charges uh, for that. So this is like police enforcement, um, if they're having more issues with parking, anything else that would um, create time um, and expense to the community for now having cannabis um, businesses there. Uh I favor a waiver for a social equity act, uh, applicant for the first year. Okay, thank you. So, Nader, Ashley, are there any changes that you would like to make, or are you still yes to the social equity candidate paying local fees of $100? I mean, in the spirit of compromise at the fine with reducing the fee um, maybe by 50 percent um, I, I think that you know there, there's two sides to it in my mind you know you when, when you look at the numbers and you think all right you know 50 or 100 dollars isn't that much but it does eventually add up um, when you start tacking on other fees and then the purchasing of equipment um, but then there's also the fact that we want to make sure that these applicants are creating some sort of connection um, to that locality. And we have done away with the residency requirement. Um, 
and also 50 or $100 they able to manage that uh, at the start of creating a business. Uh, it's kind of worrisome in my opinion. Thank you, Nada. I agree with that statement. Ashley? Um, I need to think about it a little bit more. You know, I still feel like there's a little bit of confusion. Again, this is the hard part about having my compliance and enforcement brain coming into social equity is that we don't really know like how towns are going to deal with the municipal aspect of the cannabis market. Um, most importantly, I guess I'm thinking about the need for, you know, possible law enforcement if theft occurs, if um, really more on the side of protecting the people in the facilities. And I'm already, you know, we're already trying to figure out ways that um, a broadening um, the Department of Liquor and Lottery to help with the increased demand that's going to be needed for enforcement and compliance for the cannabis space on top of at the agency of agriculture, expanding perhaps their um, enforcement officers and their teams so that they can handle the influx um, of the cannabis industry. So I agree with what Nader said about you know establishing that local relationship and that fees. And since we don't really know exactly what the percentage tax is going to be to municipals, I think this is just another win for towns to feel that they uh, want this in their town, that they feel that the industry is already giving back to their community. Um, but like I said, I need a little bit more time um, understanding exactly how we're going to pay for more enforcement individuals as a result of the industry in and of itself. And so this would be just for a local fee, whether they use it for law enforcement or not. Um, the feeling behind having a social equity candidate pay with the local fee with that connection. Um, and, you know, Nada made a really great point just now saying, you know, we're done away with a residency requirement. You know, this can start to establish a connection between the, the candidate and the local community that they will be um, working as as a business partner, essentially. Um, and But, you know, Julio has made a good point that would waive everything and maybe that first year should be waived. Um, so, Julio, I see your hand up. Yeah, just to explain my, my thinking a little bit, I mean, I think it would be kind of the idea that I had uh, behind all of this is that for social equity applicants, if they want to get in the industry, I would like, I was envisioning or I would like the state to be able to say, we want you if, you, if you want to enter into this market, we want you, and no fees for your first year, no government fees. There'll be other costs, clearly, um, but I, I, for me, uh, just to be able to say that cleanly and not like, oh, well, there are, uh, there are minor fees and, and that sort of thing. So I, I just think that you aren't, the localities aren't losing very much. I would think that local law enforcement, if a community is, is going to allow um, the business in their town, that the, the law enforcement, because of security issues, because of, you know, making, and you have a new business and it's a new industry and it's got a history, that I, I don't know that a $100 check buys that relationship. It should be, that's what the town's doing anyway. Uh, and hopefully the business person, when they select the town, it's because of something more favorable than that. So I just don't, I see it as a bit of unnecessary expense, and I don't see it as a great loss to the towns. Um, it, again, there are a lot of towns that would love to have more businesses um, in there, uh, people who, 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 you know, engage in business, the more commerce in their town, it is a benefit for them. So it's just, I know it, I know, I, I agree that it's not a huge barrier, but I just think just to say, you know, for our social equity, uh, you know, pool, you know, uh, if you want to get into this market, we're not going to, we're not going to impose any state, uh, you know, fee barriers for that and let you have at it and hopefully it'll take off. Absolutely. 
Thank you. Um, great point, Julio. So can we have, um, and Nita, how do you feel about just having the local fee waived just for the first year and then charging the local fee the following year? Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I can get on board to that. Um, I mean, a lot of good points are being brought up and well, I don't want to drag on, but yeah, I, I'd be okay with that. Thank you. Ashley, waiving the yeah. local fee for the first year and not the other year. And yeah, Leo, Leo, I like, I like those points a lot. Thanks, Ashley. Leo, yes to first year of local fees waived following yeah. year, the candidate. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that are three yeses for the record for local fees being waived for the first year only. Great. We are up to license transfers which will conclude this and then we get to go up to what benefits we want to create for the program. So we're, we're getting there. Um, for a social equity license transfer, this is if you've started a business and have used uh, the social equity program to do so, about if you transfer it over to someone else, your business is being sold. So if you transfer to another, transferring of the social equity license is permitted However, the new social equity licensee, if they're a social equity candidate, they must take over their previous owner's fee schedule. For example, um, if they're in the third year of the transfer, all of the third year fees apply. So um, if they're supposed to pay that third year, they are able to get that 50% of the fee. Um, they will, the new social equity candidate cannot just restart the clock on that business. If you transfer to a non-social equity licensee within the five years, the new licensee will need to repay any cost savings the company received to the social equity program. After five years where you will be paying regular fees, transfer of ownership is allowed without penalty. Ashley, your thoughts? Ashley? Nada? Your uh, one point of clarity. So with transfer to another social equity licensee is permitted. Um, does that also cover the other license that we were talking about? The um, Thing with the diversity and inclusion license is that under that umbrella we will be talking about the diversity and inclusion license once we um fully discuss the social equity plan uh program so this is only for social equity um licensee to another social equity licensing okay so uh all right so i'll just I'll wait until we uh, discuss further, but um, at the moment, this does make sense to me, yes. Thank you. Julio? Um, just so I understand how um, the first, uh, the transfer to another social equity license fee works, if, if I want to transfer my license in the third year, but uh, or let's say, yeah, it's the third year. But in my second year, I got a 100% waiver because of financial hardship. The social equity licensee, and let's say, let's say that they they did have a hardship that they they, they did they were very well off. Their their market took off. That's maybe why they're acquiring licenses. Um, they would not have any obligation to backfill that waived fee, um, but rather just, just take it going forward. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Because it's not based on the licensee holder, it is based on the licensee's business. So we're not determining when we give the waiver, we're saying how the business is doing, not 
how much money the licensee holder themselves have. So but, if, but if the transfer was to a non-social equity licensee, under my example, they would have to backfill that waiver? Yes, because the okay. non-social equity licensee holder would not be entitled to any of those benefits. Okay, I, I, I understand it. Um, I just want to make sure I understood that part. I, I understand about like the, the fee rates, but I didn't know about waivers, that how that might occur if you had to repay, if a fee waiver was considered cost savings, and I, I think you said it is. Um, it's a great question, great question. Uh, I guess the part I'm thinking about, and I'd like to hear other comments, is just whether um, five years is too long to repay the cost savings. Um, and, and with this, and, um, the, with this, would this continue like for successive licensees? Let's suppose I acquire the license, I've got five years to pay, I pay one fifth of the cost savings, and then I transfer my license now to another uh, person. And suppose that person is also non social equity licensed. Does that, does the second non social equity licensee acquire the debt? to pay off and do they have five years or do they have four years now to pay off that? So the non-social equity licensee would not have been entitled to any of the benefits that a social equity candidate received. So within that five years, if someone acquired a social equity candidate's business, um, they would need to pay back any cost savings that company received because they were a social equity candidate. They don't need to pay. So if they acquired the company in the second year, and so they must pay back the application fee, they may pay back the first year of licensee wage and whatever benefit they receive the second year. So 75% of the fee. So and then just, and just from whatever was before, not not after because they haven't received those benefits yet. And are you paying prorated over five years or you could just pay the lump sum on the last day of year five? So whatever the person receives of to the date where it was transferred. So if they received two years of benefits, the new owner of the company would just need to pay back whatever the two years of benefits the company has received. But they have five years from acquiring the social equity license to pay back, right? No, uh, within within five years just meant for the first five years. After five oh, years, right. you could transfer the business without any penalty. Oh, I see. So the five years is a, is I'm not able to transfer to a non-social equity licensee at all for five years. Is that right? Well, you can. If you transfer within the first five years and the licensee holder is a non-social equity candidate, then that the new owner would need to pay back the Cannabis Control Board or a social equity program specifically the revenues or the benefits that were waived. So say if the first year is 10000 the second year was 5000 and you took it over at the end of the second year, then the new owner would have to pay the social equity program $15,000 for business, up front. Before acquiring the license. Before acquiring the business. I see, okay. I misread this to mean that you had a five-year payment plan uh, with to, to, to repay the cost savings. So that was, I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, we just have to stop here for a moment to see if there's any public comments. I do see Ashley and Nader, your hand raised. Public comments? Uh, sure. Uh, can I ask a quick question or are we going to yeah. public comments? 
We we have to go to public comment, but I will answer your question. Now. We do. We have public comment. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nicholas Shorman. I'm with Vermont Normal. Uh, I've been attending these meetings frequently, but I think it's my first time speaking in front of the camera. Uh, I understand it's Thursday at 4 p.m. and we're all doing like the weekend, but I kind of wanted to put, um, you know, somewhat of a big picture idea up there, which is that, you know, one of the main reasons why we are here today um, creating a regulated market for cannabis is because it was made illegal in the first place um, under the, you know, under racist and xenophobic uh, frameworks. So as a result, moving forward, um, the, um, the regulatory result of us regulating it should be a value-driven marketplace as opposed to a profit-driven marketplace. So with that said, I think it's imperative that we look at, you know, any chance we can have to waive fees for social equity applicants should absolutely be taken up, whether that is with a local fee, uh, license fee, which you've obviously been discussing, um, and that um, it is important to go at this not from a profit-driven uh, mindset, but from a value, uh, um, how do you say, a value-driven uh, approach. Um, and I think you've all been doing a fantastic job at, at keeping that mindset uh, at the forefront. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing what you all have to come up with in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? I think that's it, Gina. Thank you, Julie. Nada, what was your question about this slide? My Danica, can we go back to the slide, please? Absolutely, as soon as it comes up. Thank you. So it was just a quick clarification that if a social equity licensee wanted to transfer after the five years to a non-social equity licensee, that new non social equity licensee wouldn't have to pay back any of the uh, the fees that were waived. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I, I was just curious about that. Thank you. Ashley? So um, I appreciate that public comment. I'm thinking of this from a lens of a social equity applicant gets these licenses. Is there any provision of, so it's a year, right? Because they bought that, or they acquired that license. It's up to them if they want to renew that license for year two, year three, year four, year five. So there's no stipulation in there of how long they need to maintain that license before they can sell it. I'm just asking for clarification on that. So we assume if they're a social equity candidate, that they will be getting four years of reduced fees. Um, with that being said, if they transfer, if they sold their business within that time to a non-social equity licensee, we would want the business owner to repay that at the fees for the business um, has received or um, for, because the owner was a social equity licensee holder. Because it is for the help of the social equity candidate. Right, I understand that part, but they can sell it year two. They can sell it at any time. At any time. And I guess I'm also looking at it from the lens of like we're working really hard as a state and as a committee and as a board to create as much social equity um, and fairness and diversity for the cannabis space. I guess I'm just a little bit nervous about the, the transferring to a non-social equity licensee. That, that feels a little bit like I don't want to prevent growth. So or you know motion or you know financial you know growth of anyone, but I just feel like there's a little bit in there that doesn't feel great as far as okay, I come into this program, I get this license, and then I can sell it to an MSO. Is that possible? Is there going to be any sort of provisions of of that? No, but it would be any business. 
since there's unlimited licenses, we're not saying that mm -hmm. any uh, MSO can't come. We right. also don't, so if a social equity license has starts a business, and by the second or third or fourth year, they say, you know what, this is too much for me to handle, or I'm not enjoying the cannabis industry, but has made a name for themselves in the business. We want them to have the ability to be able to sell their business. You know, this is a program benefit to help them advance. We don't want to limit their advancement by saying you shouldn't have the right to be able to sell your business to someone else. Right. I, I don't want that to be misconstrued. I just want to make sure that there's not, you know, I'm looking at this from five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, 100 years from now and making sure that in these first five years where there's going to be so much movement and so much influx that we're looking at, at it from all those angles to make sure that we are getting these quality social equity license, licensee holders and that they feel that it is um, in their best interest to stay working and creating this diverse market for Vermont. Um, and so I, I just need a little bit more time to think about that specifically. Okay. Thank you for your suggestions on that and, and the different viewpoints. Julio, Nader, are there any other questions that we have for social equity licensee transfer? I had a question, but I'll see if Nader does first. Uh, I, I don't have questions at the moment. There's, I probably will have questions by Monday, but um, I, I yeah, I, I, have, I have some stuff to think on, and then I will probably have some questions by our next meeting. So I'll just pass it to Julio. Thanks. One thing I would like to add before we conclude, Julio, sorry, and this might be added for more understanding, is that the first one, what we're trying to prevent here um, with a social equity licensee holder is that we don't want one social equity licensee holder to come, and then they're at the end of or the middle of their license, and then they give it off to another social equity licensee who might be in the same company, in the same organization. So we don't want that someone can come in and just keep on running that time and continue to get the same benefits for the same business. We have to say, this business receives the benefits because of the holder. It's okay if you are, are a social equity candidate, but we cannot start the time again because we can just continuously restart the time. And so that's what our prevention is. One business, one, one time clock. Um, and with a transfer to a non-social equity licensee, we, don't, we want to prevent that a social equity candidate came in, started a business, but their true intention was for another person to take it over. Um, and they let someone else take it over and pay, you know, because they could have a reduced amount of fees. Um, we want to ensure that the social equity benefits are going to social equity candidates. So as you said, Ashley, we don't want an MSO to come in here, start it off with a social equity licensee, take as many um, reductions that they can possibly get by having a social equity candidate start the business, and then really just take it over once the benefits are, are over, are, are completed. Now at five years, there would be no benefit. At five years, we're hoping that the social equity candidate, you know, has stayed. It shows enough time that I see you wanted to run this company and you wanted to be with this company. Um, so, and we also don't want to prevent transfers of licenses of businesses because it would then hold people to something that may not be right for them. And we don't, we don't want to control it, we just want to provide support. Um, I hope that gains more clarity to the reasoning behind these transfers. And Julio, what, what was your question? My question was whether, <clears throat> I was trying to look at it from a buyer's perspective, the one who's going to purchase the non-socially equity buyer, or prospective buyer. So the license that they acquire, are the licenses specific to a particular site operation, or is it they're, they're pretty much all licenses look alike for the size of the operation. Like a, is a cultivation, let's say it's a two-acre cultivation license. It's not specific 
to um, the, the original social equity uh, operators or their cultivators, their two acres, it's just two acres anywhere, is that it? Um, to whatever the licensee application. So if it was 2,000 acres of land, it would just be that 2,000 acres of land. So I'm trying to figure out if I were going, if I wanted to enter the market, why I would ever pay for a social equity license because I would have to pay for back fees where if I can compete, I can just apply uh, and start with the uh, start on my own. Why would I ever, I don't understand the incentive for a buyer to, to purchase a license from a social equity seller as opposed to just getting their own license. Could you explain well, that? It would be brand recognition, clientele list that they might already supply to, you know, all of those connections that they've been made in whatever amount of time they've been in business, that becomes equitable for a company. I understand that, but what does the license have to do with that? I mean, the license is... So they, they're being taking over the brand, I'm sorry. So we're, we're talking about them taking over their company. Right, but if I have a license, let's say it's a retail license, and I want to buy your business, but I'd rather apply for my own retail license because I don't have to backfill fees. Okay. Um, so I think I think the point that that Julio is missing is that it's already created. There's already profit being generated. That's the advantage of somebody who's not just starting fresh with the application process. So um, in business in cannabis businesses, they call them license transfers instead of business transfers. Sorry, you I, might be okay. misunderstanding the the name. Um, okay, I understand. Thank you. Ashley, I see your hand raised. Do you have any questions or comments? Oh, no, that was from before. Sorry about that. Is that enough clarity? Does everybody have enough clarity behind that? Shall we hold off on voting on this till next time? People's feelings? Or, or do you want to do that now, Ashley? Um, I need a little bit more time. Okay. So let us adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Thank you. I'll second it. Thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a great meeting. Thank you for going over those few minutes with me. And we will pick up from this license, um, social equity license transfer next time. And we'll be going into the benefits of the program. So you know, put those thinking caps on on how we can really give as much benefit to a social equity candidate as possible. And remember, it's not just for the licensee holder, but for other people trying to get into the industry from all different tiers. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye.